All right, let's get started. Um, I am uh, the kind of guy that likes to get my ego stroked. So I'm going to assume that all of you are here to see this and not just so lazy that you just stick around because of the last one and didn't want to leave. So, um, I'm going to talk about writing applications at cloud scale. My name's Matt Ryan. I work for Jive Communications. I'm a, I'm a engineering lead there. And uh, I'm really in, uh, interested in cloud computing, whatever that means. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that and see if we can agree on something today. And so about a year and a half ago, since I'm interested in cloud stuff, when Jive approached me and told me that they were looking to try to build a hosted business VoIP system that was a true cloud type system that intrigued me. And so, you know, here I am. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the things that I've learned. I've done software engineering for a long time, but I had never really learned what it meant for something to be a cloud scale. I'll, I'll talk about that today. So. Um, I don't know how many of you guys have seen this poll. I'm willing to bet nobody, but uh, this poll says the cloud is the most overhyped term, IT term, of 2013, and not not just the most. I mean, it's a it's a unanimous vote. It probably surprises everybody. Um, now there are some disclaimers about this. I conducted this poll, and uh, I only asked myself. <laughs> so it's probably not statistically valid sampling, um, and I did it for the purposes of the demo, so or, or for the presentation. So it probably doesn't really matter that much. But there is a lot of hype around it. How many of you guys have been to some other cloud presentations um, here today or, or yesterday? And you maybe have heard some of the ones that I've been to. Guys have been talking about whether or not, uh, you know, what, what does cloud actually mean? And there's kind of a lot of hype around it, wouldn't you agree? Uh, yeah. We're going to talk a little bit about what that means. So um, I don't know how many of you guys know this, but there actually is a definition for cloud computing. Um, the um, National Institute of Standards and Technology, or whatever NIST stands for, I don't even remember, but they have a, a definition, and there's five parts of that. Um, I'm going to go over those. Uh, so the first two here are you have pooled computing resources and uh, they're available over the internet. So these two things, that, that's your, your hosting provider, right? Where you, where you have your website or uh, some, any, any hosting provider does this. Where I host my personal website, they, they do these two things for me. Uh, so that's not enough to be what cloud is according to this definition. Uh, the next one is elasticity of resources. This is uh, a, kind of the key to <coughs> see kind of how that works. But elasticity means that the resources that I'm accessing can expand and shrink. So you think about S3. It feels like there's no limit to the amount of files that I can store in S3. We know that there has to be a technical limit, but it feels like I can't really exhaust that, and I probably can't. I probably can't upload files into S3 fast enough to get them to run out of space. So it feels like it is huge. And yet, if I only want to put two or three files in S3, that that works for me to to right. So it's it's elastic. It can grow and shrink. I can put a whole bunch in there today. I can shrink it down to one or two tonight. It, it grows and shrinks with me. It um, self-servicing kind of goes along with that elasticity. The, in order for me to take advantage of that elastic feel, it has to be self-serving. And the idea here is that um, there ought to be some sort of APIs that I can leverage to take advantage of that. Um, that doesn't mean that in order for me to use S3, I have to use those APIs. But it, there ought to be something to be able to do that. And the last one is that the billing is metered. If I use EC2, for example, to run servers, I get billed for the number of minutes that I have a certain type of a machine running. <coughs> I don't get billed a flat monthly rate or even on a monthly basis. So when we think of metered billing, that's kind of more what we have in mind. There's a story we have at Jive um, I'm going to tell. Um, it's only sort of related, but it's kind of funny. Um, last year, uh, about a year ago, we went to a conference 
and uh, you know, I used to work at Microsoft. Um, I escaped, <laughs> and now I'm at Jive. And one of the things that I'm really good at is offending people. I can do it without even trying, and I did that a lot at Microsoft, and that's why it really wasn't a, one reason why it really wasn't a good fit for me. And so when I went to Jive, one thing I really like about Jive is my boss can understand who I am and he plays to my strengths. And of course, like I said, my strength is offending people. So we went to this conference and it wasn't a developer conference, it was a whole bunch of our competitors were there and they're all talking about their offerings that are hosted void for businesses like ours. And so my boss comes to me and told me that my job was to go around and make all of our competitors feel terrible about themselves. <laughs> and I, I knew I could do that because I, you know, he's it's playing to a strength of mine. So I went around and I'd go from booth to booth, and this is this is what I would pick on them with, because they'd have a booth up there and they would say, "Hosted Void in the cloud," and so I'd walk up to them and say, "So, uh, what does that mean?" You're in the cloud. Oh, well, our stuff is in a data center. And that's usually what they would say if they didn't tell me just to go away or I'm not technical to that. Um, so I would ask them, oh, so, well, to me, you know, having hosted VoIP in the cloud means that it's elastic. Like, I, if I'm your customer, I can have five phones on my service today, and tomorrow I can have 500, and then, and of course, None of them can do anything like that, and we can't either, but I don't allow anyone at Jive to say that we are a cloud service yet. We haven't, we're building it, but we haven't done it yet. So they would, you know, I would go around and make them all feel terrible, and, and uh, you know, so it was, a, it was a successful conference. I knew that, because the next day, um, I would walk up to one of our competitors, and, and he says, oh, uh, I've heard about you, <laughs> and he wouldn't say anything to me, and anyway, follow on is, we come back this year, and it was, a, it was a bit of a success, because this year, we would come, and we would go to the vendors, and they would say, oh, you're from Jive, I've been told to tell you, we are not cloud. <laughs> <laughs> they had, all their signage was up, and there was no mention of cloud on there anymore, so I feel like I improved the world a little bit, because I got them to be honest about where they really are. Um, like I said, we're not there, but we're trying to build it. Um, there are a lot of implications when you talk about writing an application that's meant to operate a cloud scale. Elasticity is kind of, like I said, it's kind of the key here. Um, you, you have to have your app designed so that it can support any number of users, and it needs to be able to run on any number of machines, not just a large number of machines. It needs to be able to run on one, or 10, or 1,000. You can't architect your system only for a specific number of machines in your cluster. You can't rely on that. Because you need to be elastic. You need to be able to grow and shrink, right? You're, that's how you achieve your scalability is by adding machines. You don't achieve scalability by optimizing your code because optimizing your code only gets you so far. And if you need to go from 500 to 5,000 users, maybe optimizing your code can get you there. But if you need to go to 50 million users, that'd be awesome, right? But if you need to go that big, then no amount of optimizing your code is going to get you there. Uh, so if you're going to be truly elastic, you've got to scale a different way. And this, this is the, one of the other things that I learned is that it's not just your app that has to be elastic, but you've got to be built on top of other resources that support that elasticity too. Um, other things uh, about this, the self-service here, your users are going to be able to scale their usage up and down. Uh, you need to be able to accommodate that in your, in your application and realize that the resources that you're going to use can use uh, grow and shrink. Uh, just some other implications basically here. You, you have to assume that your app is going to be run on multiple machines and that it's going to communicate between those eight machines in an asynchronous fashion. If, you're, if you are multi-machine, but the way that this node communicates with this node is by sending a synchronized message 
that's eventually going to become a bottleneck for you. So you've got to build it on top of asynchronous communication. And you're going to have to replace a lot of operating system primitives that you are used to using for regular apps with, with uh, cloud equivalents. And finally, the, the bottom one I think is interesting is that programming language does not really matter for scale anymore. You're going to scale by adding machines. Now, that doesn't mean that it doesn't matter at all which language you choose. It, it, there's, you know, some are better than others for different things, but you choose the language that's right for your, your domain. What helps you to meet your business needs quickest? Not, you don't choose C or Python because C is faster, because it doesn't really matter anymore. So you choose the one that's right for you. So the, the bottom line is, uh, this <coughs> this equation is just not going to work. So I, I, this is you know a little magical Python app. Um, it's really amazing, as you can see. It does voodoo foo. And it says Alakazam, all kinds of things. And the uh, point here is that I can't just take this app and put it on the network and call it cloud. That's, that's not going to work anymore. I, I'm going to refer to these as 20th century apps. A lot of you weren't coding in the 20th century, so that won't apply to you. Um, I was. And uh, you know the way, that, the way that we did things back then, it's just not going to work anymore. I'll give you some really quick examples. Um, so, for example, uh, I.O. When uh, I first started writing software uh, professionally back in 1995, um, you know, I was writing software for Unix systems, and we were using POSIX file APIs to read and write, or you know, maybe something a little higher than, than that, you know, fprint, uh, or print template. Stuff like that, but they're still all relying on this file system that's local, or it appears to be local because it's on the network. It has folders and you know, directories and files and stuff like that. And I'm gonna, if I'm gonna run an app for the cloud, I have to replace that whole thing, right? I, I, I can't use local file storage anymore. I've got a completely new infrastructure that I have to use. Um, security is another one. Um, I've got. Now, I've, uh, my cloud app is on tens or hundreds or thousands of nodes, and they've all got to use the same security infrastructure. And that security infrastructure has to be elastic and scale, so I, I have to use a whole new security infrastructure for that. Um, this picture is for spawning child processes. I, I didn't really find one that made any, any better sense than this. Um, but. The way that you manage child processes or child threads and how those come alive and die, kill those cute little ones, uh, you, have to, you have to have an infrastructure for that too. Um, configuration is another one. Um, you know, there's things like Zookeeper that help you to do this, but they're, again, you know, it's one of those systems, uh, message passing, we talked about this a little bit more, that you've got to have a, a message passing system that is, that is its own infrastructure that's designed for delivering messages between your nodes and your application and you know your data your database um, is a, you know a different kind of database uh, if you're if, as you grow and scale bigger and bigger and bigger you eventually get to a point where a relational database is just not going to do it anymore it just can't it, it, it can't keep up and you're going to have to choose something different so um, <coughs> Well, I went through this last night and I added these slides today because I just felt like I, I was describing this last night as I was practicing. I was describing with my hands and it didn't really work. So, this is kind of uh, one other way to conceptualize it. Um, let's say that this is your app here. So, instead of it being your app, you, you can also think of it as being um, an email, like an MTA, like uh, post fix or send it. Okay. And this is the way that I used to think about scaling my app into the cloud. Well, you take that and then you just keep adding more instances of your app in, in the cloud. You just keep adding them. And uh, that's, that's not going to work. You think about, what, you know, think about a large mail provider. You know, Gmail has the equivalent of an MTA that sits behind their user interface. 
I'm willing to bet. No, I don't have that much money to bet. Um, so hypothetically, I'm willing to bet a lot of money that Gmail is not using any off-the-shelf MTAs to run Gmail. They're not using SendMail or Postfix in the back end. They probably created an entirely new thing. So instead, what they've done is they've taken their app and they've done it like this. They, they have this concept of an application, but it's really a cluster of clusters. Right? I've got, I've got compute clusters here, and I've got storage clusters and messaging, and all these different clusters, each of them that is a cloud-scale cluster that are working together to provide this logical application, but it's not just one executable, it's, it's a number of executables running on lots and lots of nodes. And that was the mental shift that I had to make to start to understand what it meant to write an application for, for cloud scale. So, some of you might be wondering, why do you even care? About <coughs> um, maybe the apps that you're writing right now are not, you know, you don't have hundreds of thousands or millions of users. Um, you're, you're doing something for the bank or a hospital or you know, the environment that you're in is not, you know, or the, the stuff that you're doing is new and cute and fun. Maybe you're writing, you know, the next temple run that you're going to wish that you charged for because you gave it away for free and it was a huge hit. Um, so why do you care? Um, this was one of a number of examples. I get asked this question quite a bit. Um, I, you know, I do technical recruiting for Jive, uh, among other things, and I write a lot of code and then I do a little bit of recruiting too. And we just finished a round of interviewing with college students and I got asked this question by a few times, a few, a few different people. So I'm using this example of the GPS here. Uh, 10 years ago, this was kind of a novelty. I don't know exactly if it was 10 years ago, but you know, maybe 10 years ago, you could get one of these in your car if you bought a Mercedes or a BMW or some higher end luxury car. But if you went and bought a Ford Taurus or a, or a Hyundai or something, you probably couldn't even get it as, a, as optional equipment. And to buy a standalone one like this that you can stick on your windshield, you maybe could get them, but they were hundreds of dollars. They were kind of cute and fun, a neat little thing that, you could, that was maybe helpful if you were an early adopter and had a lot of money to spend on them, but not a lot of us had them. You know, we all have one of these now. I bet, I bet every single one of us in here either has one in our car or on our phone or both. You can get them pretty much with any manufacturer. And that's not even the, the biggest implication of this. Ten years ago, if, let's say, you know, I live in Spanish Fork, so let's say that I have a friend that just moved into a new house in Cottonwood up in Salt Lake, and he wants me to come up and see his new place. And so, ten years ago, the way I would do this is that friend, I would call him on the phone before I left the house, I would get detailed instructions. He'd tell me which exit to take off the freeway how many stoplights to go through before I turn left and, and uh, you know, to go past the 7-Eleven and then turn, you know, like my friend Clint here that works with us, when he was giving me instructions to house his house, it was turn, what was it, Clint? Turn southeast at the five-way stop, you know, something <laughs> like that. And those kind of instructions. I used to, you know, we used to get those before. Now, when I want to go visit my friend's new house in Cottonwood, I might not even ask him how to get to his house until I'm halfway there. You know, and then I tell my wife to text him, and he texts back the address, and then my wife puts it in the GPS right on time. We rely on this now. My, I mean, my life has changed to rely on this thing. And there was never a point in time when Garmin who makes this particular one. Um, there was never a point in time where they decided that suddenly GPSs were going to be uh, critical to everyone's life. It just kind of happened that way. And the point that I'm making is, your apps are going to do that too. The stuff that you're working on now might be a novelty and interesting and fun today, but eventually people are going to modify their lives to where they are depending on those things to function all the time. They, they, they're going to depend on them to be highly available, and they're going to depend on them to be scalable. Um, 
the you know our, our tablets and our phones are going to be the, the portals that we use to access the back ends which are going to be cloud scale applications that's the way that the applications are going to work in the future and they're starting to do that today so we've got a little bit of a demo um, are there any questions before I jump into the demo okay I'm going to jump in then um, the demo is uh, uh, don't don't get excited here. Um, I'm not gonna figure out. I'm not able to see that up there. Let's see if there we got that now. Okay. So I've got this little program that I wrote called Audio File. It is okay. Before we begin, I like Python. I do not claim to be a Python expert. So a lot of you guys are, are Python experts are kind of probably cringing as you look at my Python code that looks kind of like C code. I'm really, uh, I don't know if I'm sorry about that or not. Um, <laughs> it's just the way it is. I hope you can deal with it. So anyway, um, I've got this little thing that I wrote called um, audio file. Um, at the end, I'll put a link. You can get it off of my GitHub if you want. Uh, but don't get excited. It's, it doesn't do that much. It's this little program. I can point it to a directory with a bunch of MP3s in it, and it's going to put all my read all the ID3 tags and put them in a database. And then I can run a query against it and see things about my library. And I can use the information in my library to rename the files. That's all it does. Uh, so I can change the file naming of my MP3s for whatever reason. So. Um, I, there are a couple of bugs, but I don't think, hopefully, it's not going to crash. So, um, here's, there's three versions of this. Here's the first version. Uh, this is kind of the first stab at how I would create this using my 20th century programming brain. Um, so, right here, the very first one I've got. Okay, I've got a, I'm going to go, I've got this little function that's going to find files at a, underneath the path that have an extension. It's going to, it's just a little generator, so it's going to yield those files back to me, and for every one I find, I'm going to add that to my library. Okay. Pretty straightforward. Um, I've got a, a query capability to you know, print every song that matches a certain query, and then I've got my rename stuff down here on the, on the bottom. You guys see that okay? Okay. Um, so that's basically it. Here's my I'm not going to show you all of these, but I'm just going to give you a real brief overview. Here's my library. Um, so the library represents all the file, all the songs <coughs> that are in the library is in this class. Uh, you can see I've got, you know, it's using SQLite, so I've got a bunch of SQL statements in here, and then I've got this uh, library entry class that it represents a single entry in that, like a song, and it's also got a bunch of SQL statements to put itself into the database and so on and so forth. So. Um, if I go over here and run that, um, I've got I've got a bunch of files in this directory here. That's uh, let's see, it's um, music retest one. Um, so if I run that, okay, so it's it's working now. Um, going through finding all those files and it's gonna it's so now it's done. Um, and I can show you kind of what was in there. Um, test one, you know, there's four bands in there, um, some of my favorites. And then if I run SQLite, I can run it against the database that it made. <coughs> uh, file, MPD, and if I, I'm, I can't remember how to do this because I keep switching between things. So if I say tables, let's see, I can just actually do this. Select, star from album. <coughs> Uh, and then there I get a bunch of, oh, you can see some, if you're a metalhead like me, you can see some Iron Maiden ones in there, and some Van Halen ones and stuff like that. So it's made my database. So now I can run, um, I can run my query. This is mostly just to give you context. I can say album, let's see, artist equals, um, let's see, album equals, oh, we'll give it 812, a very underrated Van Halen album. And there's the songs that are in there. You can see that the tagging information is maybe a little messed up on some of these. I can say minus Q artist equals 
Was Jenny? They're not the junior there. I like the, the drawing there. And there's some journey songs. So it's kind of done its thing. And then I can I can do my rename. Um, and I have to, I have my uh, rename format there, um, which is mostly uninteresting. I'm going to use the same one every time. Let's see if I can. So um, I've got this little rename format that's going to change the format of the files. And you can see as it printed them out how it's changing the names of these files. So that's what it does. Um, the functionality of this is, you know, the end, end functionality of this is not really going to change. It's just for demo purposes. So um, <coughs> switch to that. So, okay. so that was the first demo. So let's say for some crazy reason you want to put this in the cloud. I don't know why you would do that because we have Spotify now, but um, maybe you would want to do that. So here's some typical approaches we might think of for scaling. We'll go, I'll just go through these quickly. Um, so, you know, I might, I might uh, think about putting multiple threads in there. I might want to rewrite it in C or even assembly because I think it's going to be super popular. And, uh, maybe I want to do buffering of my file I/O. You know, right now I'm writing to a disk and reading from disk at the same time, and maybe I could buffer that. You know, use memory to do that, or even move my database off somewhere else and uh, you know use something else besides SQLite. You just get my database off, and that's just not going to work. That's not going to achieve the cloud scale that you want. So. Let's do the next, I'll go over the next version of the demo. So the next version looks a little bit different. Um, this is audio file 2. It does basically the same things, but I've got this thread pool that I created. We can't, we can't see it. You can't see it. Oh, sorry guys. Thank you for saying that. Okay, thank you. So I've got this thread pool here. and, and if you look down here where I'm adding files, now I'm going to use that thread pool. And instead of adding the files directly here, I'm sticking the work into this thread pool. And we're still not, we're still not work on uh, cloud scale yet. Uh, this is just kind of a step in that direction. But I'm, I'm sticking the work in this thread pool. Um, I create the thread pool with this function here. Uh, that I can call, so that function is going to get called by the thread pool every time work gets ends up in there. The thread pool is not that fancy. It's a couple of queues and some threads uh, with the class that kind of wraps around them and, and runs it. So it's, it's really about anything fancy. I didn't even invent it. I just found it online and stole it. So that's what it does. Same thing down here with the, with the pattern. You can see them down here at the bottom. Um, Pointed out. We're doing the same thing when, we, when we're renaming. We're going to stick files, stick work into this thread pool. Um, the other thing that we've done here is we've changed our, our library. So there was a big problem with that first library, right? Because I had all this logic for managing my library, and all of the logic for storing the files was also embedded all throughout there. There was SQL all throughout there. So I've abstracted that out. I've got these data store objects. So I've got a SQLite data store. All the SQL is in the SQLite data store. And I've got a little interface, so to speak. Uh, it's Python, so, but it's like an interface where as long as, uh, as long as I have a class that conforms to that interface there, then I'm going to be able to stick files into it. I'm going to use that for my data store for my library. So I've abstracted that all away. And now my uh, library and my library entry are really small. They don't have any storage logic now. So um, I can do, do those two. I need to remove the, the library. And now I can run all your fun two. It's about, it's about going to be the same. I'm not, I'm not gaining any performance optimizations. What I'm doing is changing the way that my code works. And so now if I run the query, um, the album, um, album, um, 
was uh, on the way home too. So I'm still working and then I can do my uh, my rename. And so I'm still working, still renaming the file. So what have, we, what have we even accomplished here? Well, the thing that we've accomplished is to uh, What we've accomplished is we are thinking about what this app might look like if it was going to be a cloud scale. We've done a, a we've segregated the application from infrastructure. When we moved the data store out, that gave my app the ability to use a cloud scale data store. I haven't done that yet, but it's now my application is prepared to do that. It's not going to be hard to add that. We'll see that in the next one. Um, we have isolated components that can be replaced by cloud-based services, like the thread execution, right? Now when my app finds work to do, it sticks this work in this thing, and it just continues on. The main thread just continues on its merry way. The fact that the thread pool is also within my app and running separate threads in the same context is just a coincidence. It does, really doesn't matter the key is that my, my app is sticking work somewhere and moving on. So it, it has this feeling of asynchronously finding work and sending it off somewhere for somebody else to do it. That makes it so that I can scale those compute nodes out. Okay. Uh, <coughs> see how much time I have left. And uh, when we did that, we did this, this kind of did this here. We simulated uh, cloud computing metaphor with this asynchronous processing stuff. So let's do the last demo really fast. I'm hoping we'll have some time here for questions. Let's see. Okay, so now we're on version three. So here's version three. We've taken the thread pool out. I've replaced it with a different class here called uh, uh, it's the audio file message queue. It's just a in this case, it's going to be an abstraction around ActiveMQ. And I've changed my data store. Now I'm using a Mongo data store. I, I can, everything else is pretty much the same. When I find files to add, I put them into the queue instead of putting them into my thread pool. But it almost looks exactly the same. My, my main program has hardly changed at all. If I go to the third version of my library, What's really changed here? I have added a <coughs> Mongo data store class that uses the same interface as the other one did. That's going to stick the data in Mongo. That's all I had to do. The rest of all this stuff down here, the library and the library entry, they look exactly the same as they did before. And uh, I'll show you the, uh, the MQ one. It's, it's really quite straightforward. This is where the work of adding files or renaming files has been moved into these classes. So this is the one that represents at the queue that we send. We use, we use this AFMQ class to send messages. We use these handlers down here to receive the messages. And I've got separate programs that are going to spin those up. And that's all they do is start that and let it run. And it just sits there and listens for work to do. And the class tells it what to do when work comes into the queue. So they're, they're pretty straightforward. So this one just takes a little bit of more time to set up. So now I'm going to have to go over here and I'm going to start, let's see, I'm going to start Mongo. And I'm going to go over here and I'm going to start ActiveMQ. And I need to give them just a second, make sure they come up. So let's see, we can make sure that Mongo's up by running my Mongo power again. So if I see, I use this audio file, that's the database, and then if I uh, show collections, that you can see, is that big enough? Do I need to make that bigger? I'll make it bigger. If I run that show collections, you can see right over here, there's a collection named songs. See that? <coughs> uh, that's in there from when I ran this before. I'm going to take that out here in just a second. Um, let's make sure my message queue is up. So here's my active MQ window. And 
it's yeah, it's up. So I need to reset my Mongo database. If I do that, you can see the little spinning washer there for the Mongo window. And there's no songs now in the in the collection. There's no song collection. And I'm going to run my at file worker, and I'm going to run my rename file worker. If I go back over here to ActiveMQ and refresh again, we see now, if you can see that now there are consumers here. There's those, those guys are listening on those queues, so we're ready to go. And this is going to be a little bit different when this runs. So now if I go audio file 3, test 3, when I run this, what you're going to see is this is going to complete almost immediately, and then the other one is going to be uh, going like crazy. So there it's done, and here's the other queue <coughs> taking the, or the other part, taking the work off the queue and adding it into the data store. Everything's now happening completely asynchronously. If I, I can still do my query, you know, so I can do the audio file 3 Q um, album equals uh, not all the songs got in there. That's one of the bugs that I was telling you about. Um, I know that that's there. Um, I didn't have time to fix it. And I can do my rename here too. Um, there's my rename. And again, you're going to see the. Well, let's see. That should have. That should have worked. No, that, that did. It did work, sorry. It doesn't print any output, but there's all the rename stuff that came in on the rename thread. And if we go over to ActiveMQ again, we can refresh and see. I think I hit the wrong button, yeah. So you can see there's a, there was a bunch of messages that have been processed. Like I said, they're not all coming through. Um, and if I go look here in Mongo and show collections again, there's my songs collection that's back in there. So it's all <coughs> sort of working. Um, and uh, anyway, let's go back over here. I'm getting one for a long time. Okay. So what this has done is we've replaced SQLite with the Cloud Scale Data Store. Uh, it could be any number of databases that we could have done to do that. We've replaced our thread pool with, uh, with a message queuing system that's its own infrastructure. These are all running locally on my machine, but if you were to do this in the cloud, you'd stand up your own clusters for all of these things. There's other things that I could have done if I had time uh, to try to make this more interesting, but I just ran out of time to do it. Um, a lot of other things that could be done. So the takeaways for this are uh, it's not enough to put an app on the internet to call it a cloud app. You have to develop it for cloud scale. Um, all the infrastructure pieces have to be that way. So just taking an application that exists today, sticking it there uh, in, you know, on, uh, on, a, on the internet might not do it for you because it wasn't designed that way from the beginning to use cloud scale components underneath. And that's the expectation for applications for the 21st century, so it's something we're all going to be doing. Um, so anyway, are there any, um, this is my contact information, by the way. You can, you can find me on Twitter, at Matt B. Ryan, and uh, my GitHub has the project if you want to take a look at it. Any, any questions? So, so I mean, your, and your demo was, <clears throat> Assuming right, it was one file, but but that message queuing is somehow able to. Um, or am I correct in assuming you're you're kind of setting up callbacks in the in the script, but the the message queuing API is able to you know, either launch it on a separate thread or on a separate process and reinterpret that. Or so when the the way that ActiveMQ works at least is. That <coughs> You, you start the apps and you tell them they basically register a callback to be to be invoked by ActiveMQ when 
something happens on a cue that they are listening. To. Okay. So, so there were, you saw in my in my. Uh, let's see, I was going to show you here. Just a second. You saw here in the. Uh, here in the active MQ window, there's these two cues here. You can't really see the names, but there's two two different named cues in there. And so one of these is for file renames. That's this one up here, and one of them is for additions. Okay. And so the 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 worker that's going to handle uh, library additions listens on that queue, and then on the other side, um, somebody is connecting to that queue and posting things into that. And so every time a message ends up in the queue, then the listener on the other end, that their callback gets involved. That's that set the on message. I'll, I'll show you again. Let's see. Um, yeah, right here. So this on message handler here that gets called when a, a message hits that queue that it's listening for, and it picks it up and does something with the data that it got out of the queue. Okay. Does that answer your question? I guess my brain's having a hard time wrapping around it because I've. Yeah, you know, I've grown up with the paradigm where you know one file, one process. You know, so if you have like the same file having the callbacks that may be launched by a separate process, is, is that maybe what's going on? Or what when you talk when you say file, what do you? Well, I mean the the script here. Okay. I mean the you know traditionally one script is interpreted by one process. Mm -hmm. So maybe a way to think about it is that we've changed the responsibilities of each script. Right, so the, the one that we execute, the, the audio file script, its responsibility now is to find files that need to be added to the library and stick them in the queue. That's all it really is doing. Its, it's responsibility is not to get them into the data store anymore. It just knows that when it sticks it into the queue, there's somebody else that has the responsibility of taking work off the queue and knowing what to do with it. So it, like, there's like a segregation of of concerns or responsibility there. You've got two separate processes running. One's putting work into the queue, the other one is taking it out. And they, <coughs> the, the messaging infrastructure itself is completely, it's its own system. It guarantees delivery. Um, and so once I stick it in there, if I don't get an error, I know that eventually someone's going to pick it up. It'll eventually get to it. But, yeah, but, uh, oh, okay, go ahead. Do you find that latency reporting on the, the on the state of the queue more effective being handled by the queue itself, or do you recommend a third process to do the analytics for that? Uh, I'm not sure. I so you have a list of items that are going into a queue. Obviously, those don't resolve synchronously. We're intentionally doing this asynchronously. If that list is unexpectedly large, or for whatever reasons, hardware issues or communication issues are hampering that. Reporting on the progress and the states, do you typically want to handle that within the same queue? So as in the queue self-report says, hey, I finished this one, hey, I finished this one. <coughs> or do you prefer to program this in a more aggregate approach where you have uh, a separate process monitoring the queue's behavior? Uh, I don't know that I've ever faced that specific thing. What, what do you think, Steve? Do we see something like that with the queues that we use? Well, uh, there's kind of a few different approaches on that. I mean, what you want to do is, I mean, you're trying to get analytical information about the runtime performance of, of the system. You're trying to be able to diagnose issues in case something's like ransomware or something. Is that kind of what you're getting at? Uh, well, that and or let's say, you know, he was loading up, you know, a couple hundred songs with that. If I had to import my entire library from my iPod out to a cloud storage system, obviously that's not going to happen in five seconds. Mm -hmm. I, as a consumer, am going to want to know What's the status on this? Or are you going to transfer from one cloud solution to another? I need to know, or I at least want to know, has this been completed? What state of progress am I in? I'm just wondering if the queuing mechanism would be a more effective place to handle that than to have a, a kind of a third observer function. But what you want to do is, what, what you've got here is essentially a number, a number of commands that are running. And what you, when a command is ran on one of these workers, you want to admit an event one command is completed. And so <coughs> you want to have another observer that is observing the completion of the events and keeping track of the state of the processing of commands for these files. And so typically when you have commands that are running, you want to have an event that is emitted, 
that talks about the that that uh, projects the, the state or the result of the demand that ran. And there might be multiple events as well that you want to keep track of, but you want another service that actually takes care of retrieving those uh, or subscribing to those events to keep that kind of state in mind. Then you'll have um, queries that you make available or expose against that basic yeah, state machine that, that's keeping track of all that. Uh, and really that depends on your use case. If your use case is specifically to display information to the end user in terms of like, here's the percentage that I'm done through, that, that's going to look very different than, say, a monitoring system that's mostly, the thing that's most important to it is, okay, you, each item is being completed in a timely manner. Um, whereas the, the user is going to care about the entire batch of items monitoring system may, may or may not care about the entire batch of items. They may or may not care about how long it is. It really is very specific to the use case. So in your example, um, it seems to make a lot of sense for some sort of tracking across all of the items with a, with a completion event uh, being emitted. And when that event is emitted, you know, updating your little status bar being like, okay, we're 300 of 1,000, okay, we're 400 of 1,000, we're 500. But that use case is very different than, say, me having to track each individual item because I need to know exactly when each one is done so that I can go do other things on it and maybe rename operations. So it's all very dependent on what you do. Okay. Yeah. Um, sorry if this, if this is kind of a new question, but you mentioned that um, with scaling with the cloud, that relational databases aren't going to cut it. What are some of the most common and best solutions <coughs> find a will in that scalable environment? Um, so my experience is, is with Jive. That's really all I can say too much. And um, you know, we look at and use a couple of different um, different types of NoSQL type data stores. They have their own they have their own qualities, things that they're good at and things they're not good at, and you have to kind of pick the one that's right for your job domain. That's why we, you know, we don't rely <coughs> only on Cassandra. We have the Cassandra cluster, and we're looking at other NoSQL clusters, and, and uh, you know, so that's that's kind of kind of the, the general answer to your question. The the issue with the relational databases is just eventually you get to a point where the relational integrity and the, you know that's that's kind of what I was talking about with, with the synchronicity, right? Um, I might have a cluster that's got 10 nodes in it, for example, but eventually the need for all of those to agree on the state of the database, um, that's not asynchronous, and so it, it ends up becoming a, a bit of a bottleneck. Whereas with something like Cassandra, for example, I can just add nodes, I can add them on the fly, I don't have to bring the database down, and it will use as many nodes as are available in the cluster. It's got algorithms that are designed for allowing it to scale shrink and grow as it needs to shrink and grow and it doesn't really uh, depend on it, 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 you don't have a dependency in, in that cluster of its size or its <coughs> ability to you know, shrink and grow and be elastic. Perhaps to that point, Matt, it's, it's not so much NoSQL versus RDMS, but the fact that the NoSQL databases have been created and grown in this 21st century where the cloud scale has been a factor to drive among those specifically created for that as was Cassandra. That gives them an edge at the moment of the relationals which are from the 20th century model, as Matt said. So it's nothing inherent about relational. It's not relational. I know people that's making a difference. It's about when they were born and what what world they've been born into. And that's giving right now the non-relational a huge edge in a stable cloud scale. So I, your question, though, is, very, is in a way very similar to his question, which is, you know, which is, I'm looking for something, I'm looking for something to solve my specific use case. Um, this may or may not solve your specific use case. One of the things that I like to do when I'm looking at a problem like this is look at really big players out there and how they are solving the, a very similar problem. But for example, Wikipedia uses MySQL, but it uses it in a um, like a master with many, many, many slaves model. And that works good for their problem, but might not work good for your problem. 
on have issues with stale data when you receive it on the master, how long does it take to replicate it on the slaves? Your app has to be designed around those problems, around solving the issues that whatever NoSQL solution or MySQL solution or whatever your data storage solution is, the hurdles that you will have with it. It almost seems like probably you could have both solutions in place and then access one as either the asynchronous or synchronous status is cheap. Now you're talking to CQRS magic right there. Command through response stream. So you write it to your non-relational, you can actually <coughs> your relational later for a different read and a different service. There, there are very clear patterns around that. Well, common theme too with the with all of these questions I've been asked and the problems is that if you're architecting for cloud scale, then it becomes a lot easier to switch in not components, like what kind of database technology you're using, what kind of uh, MQ <coughs> queuing service you're using, or anything like that. I mean, if you architect that way from the ground up to be cloud scale, then it's a lot easier to change those things, whereas if you did it a different way, um, maybe kind of the old school 20th century ways we were referring to it then, you run into problems when you try to change out those things. So that's kind of the beauty of cloud scale and a large way too. So just to do a time check, we, we are at time. I'm happy to stay here and answer questions if you've got them. I just don't want you to blame me if you have to stand in a long line at lunch. So I'll stick around.